So uh, talking about translational uh, science, so today we're going to talk about the ischemic conditioning. So it's a pretty old concept and I will convince you it's still around and uh, how we can harness the potential to save uh, cardiac muscles. So this is my conflict of interest. So we're going to talk about the ischemic uh, reperfusion injury. We're going to describe the concept of uh, con ischemic conditioning, and we're going to touch base to future stress strategies. So there's a question. Ischemic conditioning can only be applied prior to myocardial ischemia in order to reduce heart injury. Is it true or false? So it seems everyone agrees it's uh, false. So I'm going to show you why. So first slide, please. All right, so this is a young uh, gen gentleman, 51 uh, years old. He suffered from uh, anterior uh, myocardial infarct. We were able successfully to uh, address the issue of uh, uh, coronary artery occlusion, but then when we look at the ventriculography, we see clearly that we still have a deficit of uh, contraction on the anterior uh, wall of uh, left ventricular. So this gentleman suffer from uh, acute myocardial event, but still suffer from uh, uh, affected ejection fraction, eventually may go to a heart failure. So what can we do for this uh, young man? Of course, we can do a reperfusion, as is the goal, either by PCI or cabbage, but we see that the still uh, problem of, of contraction is probably due to reperfusion injury or maybe the time uh, before the artery was opened. So in the worst case, we can offer other alternatives. We have uh, stem cells. Problem with stem cells is the poor retention of cells, so it's something we need to work on. But also we may offer heart transplantation, but we have a limited uh, number of organs. So these three uh, alternatives I will discuss and now we can uh, improve this uh, outcome today. So what about the reperfusion paradox? We need reperfusion to save the muscles. Everyone will agree with that, but the problem is a double-edged sword, so we know reperfusion will induce some injury in the tissue because of the uh, introduction of the oxygen. So we see here down there there's a difference between complete ischemia and what happened during reperfusion. So that will affect both from the muscles, the protein, the mitochondria, the membrane, the metabolism, so it's quite a complex process. So what what about the, uh, the uh, area at risk? So if we don't have any reperfusion, so uh, all the uh, muscles at risk due to the uh, coronary occlusion will be at risk of having myocardial infarct. As we can see in the small uh, picture, blue is perfused, but the pink is the area at risk. So when we do a timely uh, reperfusion, as we can uh, uh, observe in a previous uh, gentleman, we can save up to 50% of the muscles in the area at risk. We still have a 50% of this area we can work on. So this is another opportunity here of uh, any intervention that we can address the early cardiomyocyte loss. So what has been tested so far and what is the concept behind saving muscles? So there's multiple players uh, regarding cells and other structure involved uh, in the reperfusion injury. So some uh, uh, medication has been tested and other uh, application looking at, for example, reducing cell adhesion for leukocytes, playing for the uh, accumulation of uh, free radicals and uh, inhibition of calcium overload, mitochondria, uh, pore opening. So there's a lot of opportunity to play in the cells in order to save the muscles. But looking at the clinical application, what has been tested so far has been quite disappointed. So basically, a lot of these trials failed to demonstrate that when we addressed uh, some key issues of the ischemic injury, we still can have any good uh, beneficial effects. So what is ischemic conditioning? This is a pretty old concept about 30 years ago. So this is the idea of applying mechanically an occlusion of the coronary artery for a few seconds or minutes, then release, and repeating this cycle a couple of times. So classically, this has been described prior to myocardial infarct, and it was able to reduce ischemic injury. So in the classical pathways, this has been uh, tested just a couple of minutes prior to ischemic injury. But we can also have the delay preconditioning, which can be applied up to two to three days prior to the ischemic event, and we still have some beneficial effect to save the muscles. 
The other one is the pair ischemic conditioning. So during the myocardial infarct, there's still a possibility to take that into consideration to, to save muscles. And we also have the post ischemic conditioning, which is probably more interesting because this can be applied at the time of reperfusion. When we open the coronary artery, we reocclude it and then we reopen it a couple of times and we still have a beneficial effect to reduce ischemic injury. So there's an, another one now which is named the remote ischemic conditioning which is the application of a cuff, either on the arm or the limb, and through a complex process of either circulating or through neurohormonal effects, we will have protection on different organs. So when we look on these, what are the mechanisms involved? So what is exactly the survival pathways that are activated when we do either pre, post, or pair ischemic conditioning and the remote ischemic conditioning? So Underlying effects of the ischemic conditioning is the signaling pathways by activating of the kinase. The risk kinase and the safe kinase are the activation of a well-known uh, survival kinase. We also have, uh, uh, importantly, the activity of mitochondria, either through the activation of the ROS in a small quantity, and also on the uh, ATP uh, channel opening and closure of the mitochondria, and importantly, we have the heat shock proteins, which is the HSP. And these are the most important player underlying effects of this ischemic conditioning. So now, what is the ischemic conditioning clinical translation so far? So looking only on the phase two clinical trials, we see that the post ischemic conditioning Three quarter of the studies demonstrated beneficial effects where we can save up to one third, I would say, of the muscles. And then if we look at the uh, uh, remote ischemic conditioning, half of the trials demonstrated beneficial effects from 10 to 60% uh, capacity of reduction of infarct size. So the concept is well there and still some beneficial effects. So looking back to the young uh, man we just discussed before, can we reduce early myocyte death by harnessing this uh, clinical translation of ischemic conditioning? So we know that the pre-ischemic conditioning major limitation, it, we can't predict who's gonna have the myocardial infarct and when. And the post-ischemic conditioning, the major limitation is this can only be done at the uh, uh, catheterization catheterization laboratory or during open heart surgery. So still, it's not perfect. So can we harness the endogenous mechanism and cardioprotective uh, uh, phenomenon underlying the ischemic conditioning? Can we develop some uh, compounds and regions and drugs that can be administered to patients? So this is what I'm gonna talk about. So we're looking for pharmacological uh, conditioning mimetic agents that can harness the ischemic conditioning or the heat shock. So one day I met a guy from MIT, you know, the all smart guys from MIT, and I uh, explained the idea. So he told me, this is a very good idea, Nick. So thank you, Mansour, for the uh, uh, helping. So what has been tested so far as the conditioning mimetics in the clinical arena? Glucagon-like peptides, darbapoietin, uh, erythropoietin, cyclosporin, all these drugs have been tested so far in clinical application, and again, they failed to demonstrate some beneficial effect looking at the infarct sparing. So we still have to better understand what is, uh, what is involved. So the mediator of the heat shock response are the heat shock proteins, HSPs, and these are chaperons that are very important in the homeostasis to protect the cells. And these are named according to their molecular weight. So, these are responsible for the 3D uh, protein folding, cell survival, and everything basically what is happening in the cells. And the uh, HSP32, which is the M-oxygenase one, is probably the most important cardioprotective uh, proteins. So this is a typical example of the stress. So we have uh, folded and unfolded proteins. So the HSP will help the uh, denatural protein to regain the normal 3D you know, conformations. And then there's a positive feedback loops where HSF, heat shock factor one, which is a transcription factor, is inhibited by the HSP. And the HSP will go 
to take care of the denatured protein, then we'll release the heat shock factor one, will be phosphorylated going in the nuclei, then looking for DNA sequence, and then you will have upregulation and synthesis of new HSP protein. So that's the positive feedbacks. So HSF1 is major player in the heat shock response, and the end product will have uh, HSP, uh, several ones, including H, H, uh, H, H, HO1 for M oxygenase 1. So we uh, discover the celestrol, which is a natural occurring compound, which is a HSP90 uh, modulator of the activity, and this one demonstrated to have infarct sparing effects. So we demonstrate in cardiomyoblast in culture that we have a rapid phosphorylation of ERK and rapid phosphorylation of AKT, which are again survival kinases. And then when we look at HO1, we have upregulation at the uh, mRNA and also in the protein level. So we look on different models from the in vitro to ex vivo and in vivo model of ischemia reperfusion, and we tested uh, these compounds to protect cardiomyocytes. So we have here an ex vivo experiment where the heart is subject to global warm ischemia and the medication was infused to protect against uh, ischemic injury. And this is a typical uh, data recording of the pressure generated on the ventricle. We get the end diastolic pressure, maximum pressure, the maximum DPDT, which is uh, systolic function and diastolic function, minimum DPDT. So this is a typical image where the, the heart is pumping normally, then we do global ischemia, so there's no uh, pressure, and we can see the increase in diastolic pressure. This is the reperfusion, and because you have good contraction then, you have reperfusion injury, and you have a slight recovery, and when the celestrol is given to the heart at the time of reperfusion, you see there's a big difference on generated pressure, same with systolic and diastolic. And then when we look at the tissue, looking at the TT sustaining, we have a reduction compared to vehicle control, and the release of troponin is decreased also in the coronary effluent. So when we tested in vivo, after two weeks of a myocardial infarct, the medication was given uh, systemically every day, and we have a reduction of myocardial size, and then also improve in cardiac function. So we wonder if we can develop and generate other compounds with similar effects of infarct sparing. So we know the target was HSP90. So what we have done is to test it. This is the HSP90. We, we know we have different modulator of HSP90 around. So we tested all of these with the celestrol, and then we made some modification around the structure in order to find more potent drug. So this is just an example of different compound with a slight modification, and we see here in the dark, this is upregulation of HO1, and just with slight modification, we're losing this effect. So not all the compounds are the same, and when we look in vitro for cell survival, compared to vehicle, and compared to celestrol, we observed that some compounds has better effects, and we validated these in ex vivo and in vivo models. So moving forward to other translation and application, can we improve organ function to improve the number of organ and also transplantation, for example, for the young man we just talked about? So at the SHIM, we're doing lung transplantation, the only program in Quebec. So we have sometimes these kind of lungs which are, which are not good to be transplanted. So what we are doing is we're using the ex vivo uh, uh, perfusion system in order to improve the function. And this is a clear opportunity for us to test it, this medication in the system. So this is a movie showing the uh, perfusion system and the lungs are cannulated through the trachea and then we see the lung insufflated. So we are measuring blood uh, exchange, we're measuring also the weight of the organ, we're doing some biopsies and we have a very, very uh, thorough uh, characterization of everything. So that was the lung before. This is an animal model of uh, two hours of uh, global warm ischemia. So the, the lungs really look crap and this is a lung that received one of the medication that we are testing so far. And this is bronchoscopy. This is with the compound. This is without the compounds where you clearly have accumulation of fluid and, uh, and dysfunction of the organ. So now we move to the DDC model, donor after cardiac death. So we know there's an opportunity to take the heart for transplantation 
condition, but we need to recondition and to test this organ prior to transplantation. So we developed the same model in the rat of uh, uh, global warm ischemic injury. And then when we tested, this is a heart without the compound, and this is a test uh, with, with the compound at the time of reperfusion. So after global warm ischemia, so you see clearly there's an improvement of cardiac function. So there's another though, so a, a, a way to use the ischemic conditioning for the organ preservation. And the third way we can help the patient who I just talked initially, it's about optimizing cell therapy. So we know the principal limitation of transplantation of stem cells is the poor survival, but also the poor function. So at the SHUM, and in collaboration with Terry R from TGH, we did uh, uh, 80 patients with two protocols of intracardiac injection of autologous stem cells. So we harvest the cells, we, we select the cells on the same day, and we transplant the cells in the heart. So what we observed is the same as other people and other researchers. Some patients will improve cardiac function with stem cells, and, and some other they don't. So when we look at the genomic of the patient that responds to the treatment, we have clusters of genes that are involved in better phenotype of the cells. So we try to reproduce that in the lab with some uh, exposure to, to, to the compounds, and we can improve survival of the stem cells under hypoxic and oxidative stress. And when we look at the phenotype, we can improve VEGF by 100 times, for example. So the paracrine effects of the cell can be boosted in order to have a better therapeutic efficiency. And when we transplant the stem cells that were pharmaco-optimized prior to transplantation, we have an increase of cell retention. So this is the model now we are using. And in green, we propose to uh, use a one hour of treatment by the time of cell preparation. With the new apparatus, we have an opportunity to take this for pharmaco-optimization. So in conclusion, Many neutral clinical cardioprotection study so far, because most of the time the treatment was only directed again a specific pathways or specific problem with with one molecule, not addressing you know the whole systemic issue. So myocardial ischemia reperfusion affects many cell types, so many players are involved. But then the, they signal to cardiomyocytes, and inside the cardiomyocytes we also have a complication to the mitochondria and all the other enzyme and everything. So we need a multi-targeted approach in order to have a better effects. And the combination may also be uh, better than only one compound. And the ischemic conditioning, as I uh, show you, is very interesting. It's a whole concept, but this can be applied to a numerous uh, application in clinical settings. And also we can develop some drug and compounds that can take these uh, effects up to a different level to benefit the patient. So this is a, a, ma a manuscript that was recently published last year, in fact, from the European Community of Cardiology saying that we need for novel strategy to, to have a multiple target. So thank you very much for listening for the new heart therapy, the antioxidant and superpower. And uh, I want to thank, of course, all the people working in my labs and my colleagues and uh, you for the, uh, your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Nicholas.